It's hard to think of Central American Cold War politics without thinking of coups, civil wars, and general unrest, but it's important to ask how a nation descends into 30 years of civil war in the first place. Well, in the case of Guatemala, when its government was overthrown and replaced by a CIA-backed banana republic in 1954, things quickly spiraled out of control. What followed was a long and brutal war characterized by joint resistance from both left and right-wing guerrillas, a multitude of assassinations, and even genocide. But none of this was inevitable, but rather came about from a combination of unique circumstances. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at Guatemala after the 1954 coup and the events that culminated in the Guatemalan Civil War. This is the Cold War. Okay, so the year is 1960 and Guatemala is on the brink of collapse, but a mere seven years before that, you would never have seen it coming. The decade leading up to 1954 had seen the country attempt to right their economic ship by forcibly buying land from the United Fruit Company at the company's own valuation, which United Fruit had purposefully lowered for the purpose of tax evasion. In response, the company used its ties with high-ranking members of the Eisenhower administration, including the Dallas brothers, to enlist the help of the CIA in overthrowing the Guatemalan government, which was presented as a communist threat in Central America. Initial progress in the coup was slow, but due to a collection of psychological warfare tactics, almost the entirety of the Guatemalan army and the civilian population were cowed into surrendering. For a fuller account of this coup, check out our earlier video on the Guatemalan coup of 1954. In the wake of the coup, the country was still on the receiving end of American support, with the newly installed dictator, Carlos Castillas Armas, often relying on the Norteamericanos for both advice and financial aid. Between 1954 and 1957, Guatemala received somewhere between $46 and $90 million worth of aid, with more reliable estimates putting the exact figure closer to the lower end. Armas, on the alleged advice of the CIA, created the National Committee of Defense Against Communism. This organization furthered his efforts to secure power by purging the country's military elite. This was done by drafting a list of 72,000 officers, officials, and everyday civilians deemed to have been influenced by communism. These supposed threats to Armas's rule became the targets of newly established secret societies, basically paramilitary organizations who would harass, arrest, or even kill their targets. Keep in mind, Armas not only targeted officers who were loyal to the previous president, Arbenz, but also those that wanted to remain relatively apolitical. This schism between Armas's liberationists and the newly anti-Castillo officers soon erupted into violent clashes. August of 1954 saw 23 soldiers killed and hundreds more wounded, with these clashes continuing on in the streets of the country until 1957. And yet, like always, it wasn't the military that suffered the most in the aftermath of regime change, it was the people. Armas's Guatemala was not only politically repressive, but economically as well. The land reforms that had been carried out by the previous regime were reversed almost immediately following the coup, with United Fruit Company regaining all of its former territory. Those at the top of the economic pile were the military and wealthy elite, and everyone else was left to pick up the scraps. Within this disparity lay many of the roots which would soon sprout into open conflict during the Civil War. The people found themselves fearing for their lives and began to see the government as a danger more than anything else. The worst hit group was that of the indigenous Maya population, who along with being socio-economically disadvantaged, also had to deal with systemic racism. With these mounting tensions and thousands of political prisoners simply disappearing before the public eyes, massive protests began to sweep the country. The rapidly destabilizing situation culminated in the assassination by his own palace guards of Castillo Armas on the 26th of June 1957. The guards were later charged with being a communist group and were arrested along with 49 civilian collaborators, but the truth behind the attack is still muddled. Armas had made many enemies, and with his death, his successor would only make the situation worse. 
with all non-right-wing parties banned from participating, the 1958 election saw Colonel Irigoras Fuentes elected to follow in Armas' footsteps. He had been a cabinet member under a previous Guatemalan dictator, Jorge Ubico, who himself had been overthrown in the 1944 revolution. Fuentes had also been linked separately to several plots to overthrow Arbenz. While not initially supporting Fuentes' candidacy, the CIA did eventually back him in the wake of his electoral victory, hoping to maintain its own tight grip on the nation. These security ties were then solidified in 1959 with the arrival of the Cuban Revolution on the doorstep of both the United States and Guatemala. Idigora situated himself as Castro's opposite and rival, declaring his political opponents as Castro-backed communists and even hosting the training of the Cuban exiles who would go on to launch the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. However, his actions ended up driving a wedge between himself and his military support as he attempted to conceal some of his anti-Cuban involvement. Those officers on the right considered Irigoras too soft on Castro, and those in the center considered him too heavy-handed. This disunity couldn't have come at a worse time for the new dictator either, as the mounting pressures on the lower classes of Guatemalan society finally erupted into mass violence in 1960. The populace, tired of the disappearances, the economic oppression, and the political instability, took to the streets to directly engage with the military. Initially, street fighting and bombings took place across the nation's major cities, and this continued until a state of siege was declared in July of 1960, in which all political rights were suspended. This situation, along with the mounting discontent in the army, would lead to another blow to Idigoras' leadership. On November 13th, a group of right-wing officers attempted to overthrow him in a barracks rebellion. This action is widely acknowledged as the start of the Guatemalan Civil War. The US quickly moved to support their puppet, I mean ally, and blocked naval access to Guatemala in order to allegedly block potential Cuban aid, but largely to dissuade the rest of the army from joining the rebellion. Government-friendly troops would oust the forces of the Movimiento Revolucionario Tres Noviembre, or MR-13, from their base in Puerto Barrio not long after. Defeated, the rebels slipped quietly across the border into neighboring countries, biding their time and rallying around their new leader, Colonel Alejandro de Leon, as well as two of his junior officers. By March of 1961, they had gathered enough strength to secretly cross back into Guatemala and restart a guerrilla campaign. The war was immediately bloody and Alejandro de Leon soon fell in the fighting. He was replaced by one of his junior officers, Marco Antonio Ion Sosa. Realizing that MR-13 couldn't combat the US-backed Guatemalan military alone, the new rebel leader began reaching out to other organizations to join the rebellion. While right-leaning opposition groups were initially their main recruiting target, a new group on the left, who saw Fuentes as a common enemy, would soon join the MR-13 movement. The Partido Guatemala de Trabajo, the Guatemalan Labour Party, or PGT, was a communist political movement which had existed in the country since the previous administration, the one overthrown in the 1954 coup. The movement differed from many other communist parties in Latin America given its strong youth influence which held genuine power within the party. The PGT's popularity even once reached such heights that it might have seen electoral victory under the Arpens administration had the coup not taken place. But in post-coup Guatemala, the party found its political gains reversed overnight as it hadn't yet built a massive popular base to stand on and under the new dictatorship, the peaceful road to socialism had hit a massive roadblock. By early 1962, some linked with the party began training in guerrilla warfare tactics under the MR-13, but they wouldn't see immediate action. Instead, a student protest against the sham congressional elections that the government had just held spiraled into an attempt to overthrow the military oligarchy. As unrest spread throughout the streets of major cities, some mostly younger members of PGT and other radical groups split off into their own guerrilla movement known as the 20th of October. Here, the PGT members who had been training under MR-13 saw their first taste of combat, However, poor leadership and decisions saw the destruction of two other detachments, and the uprising was mostly quelled. 
Despite this apparent setback, the real impact of the rebellion became clear as members of the PGT began debating direct involvement in the conflict. There was some apprehension from the more conservative members of the party, but nevertheless, the end result was the greenlighting of a secret armament process ahead of launching a new rebellion. During this time, Jan Sosa and other officers of MR-13 would journey to Havana. Castro, still quite upset over the Bay of Pigs invasion and Idigoras Fuentes' participation, agreed to train members of MR-13 and PGT in Cuba. With this confirmation of support, PGT finally felt ready to join the armed movement, but MR-13 had a different idea. The group proposed a united front, with MR-13 handling the military command structure, while PGT would exercise political control in the areas which the guerrillas held. This joint force organization, with the inclusion of some minor fringe groups, became known as the Fuerzas Armadas Rebeldes, or FAR, and for the majority of the Civil War, this would be the primary opposition force to the Guatemalan government. The following year, 1963, would see major developments on both the military and political front of the conflict. Early in the year, the FIR opened a multitude of fronts across the country, but found themselves consistently outmanned, outgunned, and outmaneuvered by the government forces. By 1974, the operations coalesced into two principal fronts. The first was in Zacapa province, headed by Jon Sosa, and the other was located in Isbal province and was headed by an officer named Luis Turcios. The two fronts would soon take on drastically different political ideologies, leading to infighting within the command of the FAR. Durcios' group was characterized by members who had spent time in Cuba or even Eastern Europe. As a result, it contained a stronger presence of Marxist-Leninist and Fidelist ideology. This broke from traditional PGT ideology and took a more militarist stance, unintentionally creating backlash from other FAR members. This included Jan Sosa's group, who ended up receiving aid from a Mexican businessman with Trotskyite connections, and thus his group began to take a more hardline stance against Soviet communism in favor of Trotskyist and Maoist influences. This difference would eventually be exacerbated later in the Civil War. The rebels weren't the only ones dealing with political unrest, however, as major shifts would once again rock the Guatemalan government. Already vastly unpopular with the people before the war and on shaky footing with the military, Idigoras Fuentes was walking a narrow tightrope just to stay in power. All things considered, despite winning the right-wing election without their support, the United States was the main reason Fuentes was able to remain in power as long as he did. But by 1963, his situation had become completely untenable. The US wanted to at least maintain a facade of democracy in the country, but they acknowledged that it was impossible to hold free elections as Guatemalan military advisors feared the return of Juan José Arevalo, the first president of the revolutionary period in 1944, who was currently living in exile. As talk of new elections circled, Idigoras seemed confident of victory with many of his political opponents living in exile. However, the US had at this point recognized what he hadn't, that the center-right unity of the country and the military had long fractured since his ascension, and even if left-wing parties were banned, someone else might take his place, someone less amenable and less pliant to US wishes. Their fears were nearly confirmed on November 25th of 1962, as elements of the Guatemalan Air Force rose in an attempt to overthrow the head of state. Despite Idigoras' claims that they were Castroists and Communists, the US saw that in reality it was a right-wing element trying to prevent the return of Arevalo, who was seeing widespread public support growing among the Guatemalan people. The officers feared that Fuentes was too weak politically to stop this potential catastrophe, and afterwards, even the US seemed to agree that their own puppet was insufficient. Their American eyes wandered to Defense Minister Enrique Peralta, who had prevented the November coup. He had a cordial relationship with US advisors and diplomats, and was widely respected in the army. In fact, it was his support of Fuentes, coupled with many army officers' respect for him, that prevented other military units from joining in the Air Force's uprising. 
the US was also coming to terms with the fact that Guatemala was in an active war with its own people, and despite some success, Inigoras was failing to stamp out the rebels. In all respects, Peralta looked to be a sufficient replacement. With Irigoras still indecisive as to whether Arevalo should be allowed to participate in the election or not, still convinced of his own popularity, his fate was sealed. Despite declaring a state of siege in the capital on the 31st of March 1963, Irigoras found himself to be one of the first people arrested. Defense Minister Peralta declared himself the chief of state on the same day he met with US advisors. He suspended the constitution, disbanded the sham congress, and sent Inigoras to Miami into exile. With promises to hold elections in 1965, the US breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Ironically, it would later be discovered through classified documents that the United States knew that the previous president, Arevalo, had no ties to communist or even socialist groups and would have been potentially open to working with them. With all their boasting about democratic elections then, one might ask why they didn't okay the vote since an Arevalo victory might have ensured peace in the country, since the rebels would at that point relinquish their arms. In fact, Arevalo wasn't even the one to propose buying land from United Fruit, the situation which had kicked all of this off in the first place. That had been his successor, the arguably more radical Art Benz. The truth here is that the United States hadn't just made an investment by placing Castillo Armas in power in 1954, they had made a statement. They had made it clear where their ideological and economic ties were, and they weren't going to back down. They hadn't with Idigoras, and they wouldn't now with Peralta. Drawing parallels to Vietnam in the near future, and Afghanistan in the far future, the US had made a decision to prop up one side of a conflict, and it wasn't going to risk the shame of backing out now. So there you have it. From protesters in the streets to taking up arms against the government, and from disloyal officers to rebel commanders, the opposition forces of the Guatemalan army came from a wide variety of backgrounds. The keen interest the US had in keeping their investment in Guatemala alive led to unpopular dictators, which sparked even normally supportive right-wing groups to rebel, setting the stage for civil war. As the war would evolve, it would take center stage in Latin American politics, given that a loss for the government would showcase American inability to protect their political or economic interests. So now, with the pieces set and the players taking center stage, the country was set for a brutal 30 years of civil war. But that is a story for a later date. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes, be sure to like and subscribe, and make sure that your bell button has the support of at least one major superpower so that you can lean on them when rival bell buttons try to steal back what you have rightfully stolen for yourself. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon patrons, and if you aren't already, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is the Cold War Channel, and as we think about the Cold War, please remember that history is shades of grey and rarely black and white.